Do not touch the glass. Do not approach the glass. You pass him nothing but soft paper. Ten years later, I think this film is as strong as it was the day we made it. Animal the cannibal. This has become a classic contemporary horror film. What does he do, this man you see? And there are some really classic horror film devices. There is a sense of tension and menace throughout. Look at the blood! I think we succeeded in getting under everyone's skin. It rubs the lotion on its skin. It does this whenever it's told. It's hard to shake this movie once you've seen it. I think it changed the way we thought of thrillers. I'll have to catch him, Clary. They raised the kind of genre filmmaking onto a, a higher level. Doctor Lecter. You know, I played the part with as much relish as I could. It was a lot of fun. What did you see, Clary? Everybody get Lamb. Ah! 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 There was a lot of anxiety loose, I think, around 1990 in the culture. This fascination with a figure that could somehow embody those anxieties, the serial killer. In the period from the 60s on, they were surfacing every few months. It may be that we were producing them. There's clearly, uh, inescapably, a, a, an American obsession with serial killers with that sort of darkest corner of the human psyche. I thought it was kind of sad, actually, particularly among the young people. There's a whole group of the gloomers that were like totally into Ed Gein and would go to Wisconsin to visit Ed Gein's car, which is in a junkyard someplace there. Ed Gein was a Wisconsin demented fellow who killed his mother and a number of other people and would dress them out like deer, then use the skins and the body parts and furniture around his house and build all kinds of artwork out of the parts and, and would also rob graves. The obsessive, demented killer has been a subject that filmmakers certainly focused on. Here is a serial killer based on Ed Gein in some part. It's a composite of a number of people that Thomas Harris researched and pulled from all the files. Tom Harris probably took what he felt was useful from real life, as any novelist does. I think he probably was thinking of Ted Bundy in some of the techniques of uh, luring victims into a van. Ted Bundy would pretend that he had a broken arm. You look kind of handicapped. Yeah. Put on a cast in order to sort of not seem suspicious. He may have been thinking of Heidnick, who was a killer, uh, who lived in Philadelphia, who uh, imprisoned women in his basement. What would you answer me, please? Tom Harris was a journalist. He had written Black Sunday, he had also written Red Dragon. Red Dragon is the book that introduces Lecter. Tom's next book, when it finally came out, Silence of the Lambs, but as soon as I read it, I thought, this is the kind of book that comes along once every 10 years. An unbelievable story for a film. I think what especially interested Tom in writing Silence of the Lambs was, was to try to live inside the mind of a female character, to put a woman at the center of a book and I think that was the challenge that he set himself. He must have also wanted to learn much more about Hannibal Lecter. He must have seen the potential for a far more exciting use of this character. It didn't really create a sensation as a book until it was published in paperback. And it became a huge paperback bestseller. It was bought by Orion Pictures for Gene Hackman to direct and possibly star in. I remember the price tag being something like $500,000. But Hackman had offered to direct the picture and to put up half, which he did. And, you know, word came back, they don't have a screenwriter. I was mostly a playwright at that point. And uh, Gene Hackman read my script for White Palace, and he liked it, and he said, let's meet. And he gave me the job. Gene read the script and said, you know, this is too violent for me, I can't do it, and I'm walking away from it. At this point, we got a chance to read the script. We were all excited about it, and we reimbursed him the $250,000. Mike Medavoy said, look, keep writing. Don't give up. And when you finish the script, we will find another director. Hi, I'm Jonathan Demi. We had made a number of pictures with Jonathan, and I felt that Jonathan could direct this movie. 
Jonathan had done something wild there. Married to the mob. Most people thought I was really being foolish to go with Jonathan on a picture like this. But I knew Jonathan's work, and so I, I felt that he could do a really good, tight thriller, and that's what this was. He initially rejected the idea of working on this. I don't think he even read it. I think he glanced at the coverage and said, oh, it's a slasher movie. You know, I don't want to do that. And didn't really take it seriously until there was a direct appeal from Mike Metavoy. Please read this book. When he read it and actually thought about it, he realized that there was a tremendous moral center to this story that he could support. And there was a great woman character at the center of it, which always interests him. And I read this and I thought, oh my God, I can't do this movie. I told him that I was having a very hard time getting involved and excited about a film where a man skins women. And he said, no, 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 you don't get it. You don't get it at all. This is a feminist piece. And I thought to myself, how can it be a feminist piece? A woman cop, essentially, is rare enough. But to have that character given such psychological depth and ask us to identify with her and understand her and go through this quest in her shoes, that's really rare. Jonathan's humanity and his decency and his, his sense of humor and his warmth took this very, very dark material and made it just take off in a way that it might not have done with a more standard thriller director. He also said to me, you may think I'm like such a sweetie or, you know, what, such a nice guy, but he said, I'll tell you, every single director in his heart of hearts wants to make a movie that scares the audience absolutely out of its mind. We always thought of it as a detective story. We we're always a little bit startled when people refer to this as a horror movie. This is a real hybrid of a film. It's a police procedural. It's a gothic horror film. It's a psychological thriller. A lot of people say they can't see scary movies. They feel disturbed by them. But they are entertaining, like Psycho, Rear Window, for example. I mean, Hitchcock, the master of all scary movies, said when he was asked, why do we like to be frightened? He said, what's the first thing we see when we see a baby? We go, boo. I think what it is is because you go into a darkened theater uh, with a bunch of other people, and you sit there and you give yourself a fright. And then at the end, you come out into the sunlight with millions of other people. And you've just given yourself a little rehearsal for what terror really is. But you know that you're safe. In most films, the hero is a man. So by making the hero a woman, you are doing something different. And just doing something different itself is a plus. You have stepped away from the formula. FBI! You're safe! Because, you know, we see the American male hero all the time. It's very good and entertaining, but finally it's a big snooze. Women are generally considered to be vulnerable. If you put a person who is vulnerable in a situation which asks her to take charge, you are creating a very dynamic emotional situation. Go on now, let us take care of her. This young woman goes in and takes on the monsters, and she destroys the monster. <laughs> Any good story reduces to sort of mythic elements and reduces to a kind of fable. She described it once as, uh, you know, the, this kind of mythical battle against the Minotaur. The character that she plays goes into the dark forest of evil and ignorance in order to rescue a princess and come out on the other side with greater wisdom. She's the heroic figure trying to find the answer to the riddle. Everything you need to find him is right there in those pages. And tell me how. Her mission is the mission that in fairy tales is always male. You know, it's to rescue the maiden. <laughs> I think that's the real sexual twist. In I'm going to get you out of there, but right now you listen to me. I always saw her in this part, and it was funny because she was campaigning for this part before the screenplay was ever finished. I really only like to do movies that I believe in and that I really love and I'm committed to. And uh, I, I, I sort through every piece of material I can to try and find that. Starling. I got a call there one day. Somebody came in and said, Jodie Foster's on the line for you. And I thought, whoa, 
I had never met Jodi, I'd never spoken to her. Um, she had just won or was about to win an Oscar for The Accused. So I pick up the phone, I'm very nervous, and I say hi, and she says hi. She was talking about some project that she thought maybe I would take a look at for her. I said, I think I'm already writing a great part for you. And she said, I know you are. But when we got to talking about casting, I said I thought Jodie Foster was perfect for this part. And he said, huh, okay, well, that's interesting. What about Michelle Pfeiffer? Because he had just directed Michelle Pfeiffer. We sent her the script, and I thought, you know, I'm sure she's going to want to do it. She turned it down because she thought it was too violent. I just wish I was in on it, that's all. And Jodie Foster never stopped campaigning for the part. Jonathan met with her again after the whole business with Michelle Pfeiffer fell through. And I said, what changed your mind about her? And Jonathan said, I watched her coming down the hall towards me. He said, this sturdy little figure striding along with this determined look on her face. And he said, I just thought, that's her. That's Clarice Starling. Uh, well, I, I loved her um, strength and her uh, character. Uh, and I mean that in the largest way, in terms of the things that make her who she is, the unconscious things that she doesn't even know about, the things that draw her to her fate in some ways. I mean, I think she is a great American hero in some ways, and uh, somebody who will, uh, whose lot in life is to uh, save innocent people and to, uh, to come to terms with their own fears uh, while at the same time. I think part of the great success of the film was the Starling character because it resonated very much with women. It's because of Starling that they were terrified. I related totally to her and her character. As I was growing up, I remember one of my favorite series was uh, Nancy Drew. And in a strange sort of way, Clarice is a Nancy Drew. She gets herself into terrible fixes and somehow or other gets herself out. Freeze! She has a curious mind and she's observant and she's all those things that a good detective is supposed to be. Not bad, Starling. She didn't have a love interest. I graduated from UVA, doctor, and it's not a charm school. There is definitely the absence of sexual wiles. That doesn't interest me, doctor. A fascinating thing in the movie is watching her cope with male regard. You know, we get a lot of detectives here, but I must say I can't ever remember one as attractive. Oh, I think Jonathan was very much attuned to the position of Clarice as a woman in a man's world. It was reinforced all the way through. Jonathan captured it beautifully, the way these guys look at her. This outsider, this girl. She's just this powerful little flame. Senator Martin. Dr. Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter is the greatest villain in popular fiction. He's like Sherlock Holmes, you know, arch rival Moriarty. He's completely out of his mind. He's utterly insane and evil. There's a danger almost that he's a cartoon character. So he has to be played by a really great actor. May I see your credentials? Well, my agent sent the script over to me. I was working in the theater in London at the time. Tedious, very tedious. He phoned me up, he said, I'm sending a script over called Silence of the Lambs. And I thought it was a children's story, a bedtime story. And I knew when I read the script, it was probably going to change a lot of things in my life. This is that sort of once in a lifetime part that comes along. All good things to those who wait. I tried to get him to go with Robert Duvall to play Hannibal Lecter, and he met with Duvall, but didn't think he was right for that. Jonathan Demme came over to see me in London and I asked him why he wanted me to play the part and he said, don't you want to play it? I said, yeah, I do, but I'm just curious, why, why cast me? And he'd seen me in a film called The Elephant Man and I was playing the part of Dr. Treves and that's what convinced him. I said, but Treves is a very good man and uh, I think Jonathan's reply was, as far as I can remember, he said, well, that's what I want for Lecter. But he's a compassionate man and he's a... Uh, Humanitarian, he's a, a good man locked inside this insane mind. And for some God knows what reason, I understood the man and how to play him. I knew he was the shadowy figure that in, lurks inside all of us. And I don't know why I have an instinct about those things, but I do. I'm fascinated by the shadow side of our psyches because they are also the most creative sides of us. 
If we deny the shadow side and the dark side of our nature, we live a pretty bland life or a destructive life because it'll come out in the end in some form or another. The budget seems ludicrously small nowadays, but it was $20 million. It was really a very modest production. It wasn't an attempt to go out and make an Academy Award winning film. Walker. Jonathan is very loyal, very family oriented, and his crews are full of people who have been with him from the beginning. A variety of different producers. Ed Saxon, who's his kind of constant companion. The late Kenny Ott, without whom none of this stuff would have happened. Kenny would always be there to calm the waters. Even though the story was set in Tennessee, in Washington, in West Virginia, we hoped to find one place where we could do all of that. Kenny Ott and Jonathan Demme had been canvassing the world, looking for the right city to place this story in. And the one that kept us all very intrigued was Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has a kind of coal and steel background and the fact that it has many hills and rivers and it's just packed with character. There was a wealth of locations there that were unbelievable and had never been filmed before. The great monumental buildings that are there. The Natural History Museum, the Soldiers and Sailors Museum. All the other elements came together in the small towns around there, provided some of the West Virginia look. Part of our tour in the early stages of researching was to go to all of the places that really might have been used in the story, and the FBI was one of them. And we were invited to go down there after they had read the script, obviously, and made sure that it was all up to their standards. They viewed this film as a kind of a recruiting film for female agents, which at the time was a big issue for them. And they thought this would be a, a positive force in attracting women to the FBI. Crawford wants to see you in his office. We were privileged to actually go visit Quantico and been given a, an incredible tour around the whole facility, which is nestled off in the wilds of uh, outer Washington, D.C. And they were extremely cooperative and supportive, and they gave us the FBI Training Academy at Quantico, Virginia, as a set, really. They gave us free reign, the firing range, and all the places on that campus. And we were able to do that part of the movie and get the real reality of it. Well, shooting at the FBI is cooperative and guarded. There was a lot of activity always there. I mean, you'd be walking down the hallway and three guys would bust in through the door and tackle somebody and they'd do this fake arrest and you'd be jumping out of the way. You're dead, Starling. Jody was welcomed into the training course. She did two or three days of immersion in the experience of being a student at the FBI Academy. With Buffalo Bill, it's a little different you'll find that he had a close relationship or desired a close relationship with his mother. Jack Crawford, in actual life, is a man who exists today. His name is John Douglas, and he runs the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. The Behavioral Science Unit is basically a one-crime unit. All they're involved in doing is chasing, catching, and prosecuting serial killers. I got to know John and became friends with him, spent time with the people in behavioral science for uh, research into this film. Going and visiting his offices was one of the most terrifying things that I've ever been a part of. I remember going through the offices and they're very tiny and cramped and there's cinder blocks, there's no windows. I got a case of claustrophobia like I've never had. I just wanted out of there. We all decided to replicate that pretty exactly. I think it ends up being sort of an honor to the people that do that kind of work. There was a big bulletin board with the cases going on. And there are the pictures of real women who have been harmed in terrible ways. I had sort of actually a physical feeling of sadness of how sad this was. But you know, when you're creating a movie, it's not real. So when we were doing our wall, sort of in honor of these women, we did not use real photographs. We recreated all those with Carl Fullerton. The feedback that we got was, I really enjoyed all of the dummies that you made. These were not dummies 
or fabricated bodies. These were real actors and actresses in most cases. This was a series of days in the fall. And it was raining, by the way, many of those days. And the actresses were nude, so they were partially in the water, dirty water, stinking, smelly water, or it had leaves and dirt ground into their, these were real people. So it was very tough on, on them in many cases, I think. But they did smile when they were finished. <laughs> <laughs> In the film, our character makes a patchwork quilt. We took a life cast of one particular woman, and then we, I think, sectioned apart a few pieces and put it back together so it looked a little more symmetrical. As we're following Clarice through the darkened lair, the camera actually finds the skin of what gum is making. From my studies in dissecting cadavers, at Downside Medical School, one of the things I noticed was as soon as you remove the skin, you see fat. Sometimes it's actually looked like yellow chicken fat, believe it or not, when you open up a body on some people. We had to come up with some kind of body fat because these were heavy women, so as soon as you remove their skin, you'd see all this fat. And Vinnie Altimore was around, who's Italian, and he came up with, oh, pastini. So uh, we boiled up some pastini and uh, added some uh, KY jelly, some yellow. That was uh, body fat. Oh, and Senator, just one more thing. Love your suit. It wasn't a fashion movie. I wanted it to be a movie that you could watch in 10 years and not have it be from any time. I didn't really want to nail the year that it was made in the costumes. Jodie Foster wore a green sort of heather color toggle coat and tweed jacket and pants for most of the movie, which is sort of vulnerable and also very classic and timeless. With Anthony Hopkins costumes, the fit of the costumes was very precise. We had a lot of fittings. Even though it was a prison uniform, we felt like that Hannibal would have managed somehow to have his clothes look like they were made to order for him, even if he was in prison. We went through a couple color evolutions, starting with reality, which is the orange, and did a lot of camera tests with different colors of orange and decided that somehow that didn't suit Hannibal's character. Hannibal's mask was uh, a really interesting dilemma. Colleen Atwood had a whole host of ideas, and we just kept going through them, one after the other. For a while, there were thoughts of fencing, sort of grid masks going on and all kinds of things, and then we got more and more to the sort of modern sort of idea of the fiberglass mask. The um, thought had been to have the mask have a finish on it, but when we received the sample, it was raw fiberglass, which looked like an old piece of dried up leather, or, you know, even skin, and it was so great, so it never went back for its paint job. I keep him in here. We went to a variety of sources, but largely uh, I found that the works of Francis Bacon seemed to speak to me in some very strange way. The tones, the colors that he used seem to be the kind of colors that we should have in our story. How it translated into what we did is probably most obviously seen in the cage that Lecter was housed in and the resultant carnage that happens after Lecter escapes was directly inspired by Francis Bacon. I had explained to Jonathan that what we were going to see would not even be what really existed, but what you would see if you were in the mind of the man who opened the door first. Then Jonathan walked in with Ed Saxon and Kenny. He took one look at this and he walked out the door. Oh, God. There's a yourself storage facility. The storage facility was the madness of all of us collectively put together. We just started thinking about what were the weirdest things we could think of putting into this place. The owner of this car 
asked us to cover the car because it was a very expensive car. And so when we were looking around for something to cover the car with, I think at the time, and so somebody said, well, we got this old flag, let's just throw the flag over the car. And I think how that's how that one kind of happened. The location that we used for the asylum was uh, created out of several locations that we found. The full exterior was shot out in the wilds near Pittsburgh. And then the interiors were pieced together from different parts of the city jail. We'd go to a, a, a jail and do coming down a, a stairs and through a door. Then we'd be at some other location where there was a, a like a, a bridge. And then we ended up at the set this unbelievable dungeon type of area that we then created out of our heads, which became where Lecter was housed. All the sets uh, that were constructed were at this abandoned plant, so they had this, this amazing jail set that was constructed there. There was also some primary sources of uh, photographs of like the Nuremberg trials. All of these officers lining up against the tiny windows of each of the cells that influenced me in what the hallway looked like. Agent Stoney! Agent Stoney! The notion that we were going to put Hannibal in a kind of plexiglass box really came about in a very unusual way. During the pre-production period, we did I don't know how many versions of bars. Should they be this wide, this wide, this wide, you know, and we did a million variations on that theme. Jonathan was very unhappy with all of this because he felt that if he wanted to really see the faces, then he would always have this in front of them, and so the, you know, the audience would go crazy. And then I just remembered one day how a lot of the liquor stores oftentimes were completely enclosed in, in plexiglass. And so I suggested that we do that instead, and that everybody was thrilled with that notion. There was only one person who was not thrilled with that notion, Chris Newman who's our sound man, he said, wait a second, you know. What are you talking like this? I said, well, let's just put some holes in, you know, like they do, and you know, uh, then that'll be that. Anthony used them. It's the first day funding for me. It's the very first time we see Lecter. You use Avian skin cream. So I didn't know what the reaction would be, and... Here I am, an unknown, relatively unknown actor, and not American. You know, I thought, well, either stand or fall on this performance. We knew that Hopkins was an extraordinary actor, but we wondered if he would get Lecter. First day on the set in the jail block, there had been no rehearsal, so we weren't prepared for the moment. We rolled it, and he went, hello, Clarice, and we went, oh my God, he's got it. When I was reading the script, first of all, I got an idea of what his voice would sound like. Good evening, Clarice. And once that was in my mind, I could see him for what he was physically. I could see him as a very lean, killing machine. Hair tightly pulled back, as if his brain is bursting out of his skull. So we started the camera rehearsal, and Jonathan Demi said, where do you want to be seen in the cell? Would you be sitting down, or lying down, or drawing, or writing? I said, no, I'd rather be, sta I'd like to stand right in the middle of the cell. In the middle of the cell, I said, yeah, waiting for her. He said, how do you know she's coming? I said, I can smell her. The reason I felt that that was right was to give the audience a fright because they talk about him for at least 10 minutes before he's seen as some kind of babbling psychopath. And I wanted to play him the opposite. They always play the opposite of what the audience expects. And it scares them more. Good morning. So what they see is a very polite gentleman. Good morning from the FBI. It's like a cat, watching a cat before it makes its pounce, or a lion before it kills its prey. They're very still, they don't move, not a muscle, not an eye, flick. And that builds up tension in the audience. What does he do, this man you seek? Stillness and economy is much more effective. You don't need to do all that pulling faces, although I've done a bit of that in my life, but the camera does all the work for you. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Um, I, um, I put that in at the end, just for a joke. I thought they'd cut it out, and Demi said, God, you're so sick. 
I said, this is over the top. He said, yeah, but I love it. So he kept it in. We were on set and Hopkins was sitting in a high director's chair. He had his white t-shirt on covered with blood. And there's blood all over his mouth. And, and he's sitting there and he's reading Eudora Welty, spouting to people as he walked by. He's going, I'm mad, you know, I'm mad. I think it would be quite something to know you in private life. Quid pro quo, Doc. Jodie Foster's a very fine actor, and she does her job, she does her work, and I do mine. And that's the contact. It's common sense. And then people make up this weird word, chemistry. I don't know what that means. Know your lines, show up, and get on with it. That's my philosophy. I'm here to learn from you. And she is very smart about her choices. I think she makes wonderful choices. You can see that it comes out so effortlessly, but you know that there's a lot of thinking that's gone into it. She really nailed it. She had to carry the entire movie on her shoulders. You call this easy, sir? In some ways, it's a more thankless part. It's not a showy part like Lecter. It's an anti actressy performance. And she really doesn't have any of those big acting moments that you expect in a film. Jody said to me one time, this isn't the kind of part that you win Academy Awards for. Jonathan pushed her to a real level of complexity in, in the part. Jody's performance comes so much out of who she is. Do you know what you look like to me with your good bag and your cheap shoes? You look like a rube. When I needle her, and I attack and dissect her and take her to pieces, and she has a reaction which is, I don't know how she did it. I've tried to imitate her, I can't do it. She decides she's going to hold on to her emotions, hold on to her strength and her strength, but at the same time she wants to break down and cry. And she tries to bluff it out with him, and she can't because her face gives away. I don't know, it's a remarkable performance. I can't even describe it, so watch the movie. You see a lot, Doc? Now, there are three, four, I guess, scenes between the two of them that are all basically two people sitting and talking. But Jonathan understood, and those actors understood, that those scenes were the heart of this movie. The shooting of the prison sequences took a very long time. We'd come to work every day and we'd think, how are we going to cover it today? You know, we've, we've, got, we've done this and this, you know, we're going to do this. How are we going to continue to make it interesting? Two people through a glass talking. Jonathan Demme and, and the, his cinematographer, Tak Fujimoto, found ways to make those scenes different. Quid pro quo, Doc. Tak Fujimoto was so brilliant and so calm. I think there was a synergy. I was watching, in particular, the way that Jonathan and Tak worked together. I couldn't figure out what was going on. John would say something and Tak would go, mm hmm, and, but there was very little dialogue. I kept watching dailies and thinking, he's using too many close-ups, they're all close-ups. But what that does is when you watch the movie, you, you want to back away from it. Then something woke you, didn't it? Was it a dream? So they're in very tight on your face, full face. There's no problem with that, except the focus pullers have to be whispering all the time and readjusting, so you have to be very, very still. I was so scared to look inside, but I had to. Jodie Foster was marvelous at that. I tend to be a bit impatient. In Lambs, you see both kinds of close-ups in the same scene, where people are looking right at you or people are looking offset. Did you do all these wrongs, Doctor? I think it's talking directly to the audience. So the audience feels that they're Clarice or the other character you're talking to. Don't have any so it involves a lot of audience intimacy. What did you see, Clarice? What did you see? You have two villains. The arch villain, Hannibal Lecter. But there's also Buffalo Bill. It was intriguing to me. Challenging. Complicated human being. An evil human being. I had a good deal of time to work on the part before we started shooting. I read a great deal of material about serial killers. Not a fun process at all. I mean, I lived with a lot of images that, you know, I still remember. I read a lot about Ed Gein and this guy Jerry Brudos, who was dismembering women and trying to make lampshades out of skin and that sort of thing. The sense that I got from both of those guys in particular was that they were self-indulgent. They were really, I think, addicted to this idea of sex and death sort of being close together and, and really got off on that. You don't know what pain is! He fancied himself a victim, and I think aware of the fact that he was dealt a bad hand as a child, in his mind, to a certain extent, felt justified in what he did. 
there's a tremendous amount of material in the book. Chapter 20. Whether his behavior was an earnest, inept attempt to swish or a hateful mocking would be hard to say on short acquaintance. There was a lot of flack about him being gay. I never played him as being gay. Male sexuality is a complicated thing, you know, and goes all kinds of different directions, you know. I met with female impersonators. I went to some very interesting bars, you know, looking and talking to people about, you know, a side of life that I'm not familiar with. And I came to the conclusion that, 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 that none of that had anything really to do with this. If the guy was gay, he'd be killing and maiming boys and men, and he was killing women. He was scared about the gay thing, too. And I said, don't worry, this is not a gay character. You don't want to beat that movie cliche over the head of the, you know, the mincing uh, homosexual. The stance I took was more one of an acutely homophobic, heterosexual man doing that mocking thing. It's your real pressure to look at the whole. I kind of took it that he was sort of imitating his, the way his mother might have talked to the poodle. By hearing that voice, in a sense, he's sort of talking to himself, you know, his inner poodle, as it were. The other thing he's not is he's not a transvestite, either, or a transsexual. But he thinks he is. He tries to be. He's tried to be a lot of things, I expect. He was playing with these ideas. He's tried on a whole lot of personas and just got hooked on this idea of dressing in a woman's skin. He wanted the power that he perceives a woman possesses. I want you, so I'm going to have you. I'm going to have you completely in that I'm going to skin you and crawl inside you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a simple thing that anybody can do in the privacy of their own home to kind of check yourself out to look what would I look like if I was a girl. It made it immediately accessible to people. I remember him saying, why would you want to do this? I remember that in the final meeting. They're pretty extreme circumstances, so it was hard for me to really relate to. I think he just wanted to make sure that I could get to where he wanted me to get to emotionally. I also had to agree to gain 25 pounds. You didn't really get to see a lot of her before she was put into that circumstance. She was probably very different in those circumstances than she was normally as I think any of us would be. No! Don't you leave me here, you fucking bitch! No! He could tell when I was working, and he could tell when I needed to be adjusted, and he was very delicate when he came down to talk to me, because I was sort of in a thing. But once I got in there, and I was screaming and doing all that stuff, I remember being incredibly relaxed when I got out, because I think, <laughs> isn't there that primal scream therapy or whatever? I remember getting out of the pit and everybody else being freaked out and me being like, ah, oh, you know, very relaxed. There was a bit of method work going on, you know. I mean, Jody and I didn't talk much. I got close with Brooke. I was a little wary of him. He scared the shit out of me. I mean, he really scared me a lot. Now he places the lotion in the basket. <laughs> but I think, actually, once we got into those scenes, I sort of went out of my way to be nice to him and to make sure we were okay because of the intensity of that relationship. What the fucking lotion in the basket? The shit freaked me out. You know, the, the, the scenes were um, really nasty and relating to her on that level and trying to look at her as an object was... Uh, Really icky. Ah! We'd get done with scenes and it was like, eh, glad that's over. And, you know, oh, I like you. Jody used to call me Patty Hearst on the set because I'd always be sitting with Ted. We were friends, you know. Jamie Gum's world, the book was very, very specific about the different areas that existed. The place was a kind of physical representation of the workings of his mind. But you want to come in while it's work? The idea that he led a very uninteresting surface life, Gum's life was all down below. Ed Gein, there was a photograph that we saw of his kitchen, which was one of the filthiest, most depressing things I've ever seen, with piles and piles of paper and food. The kitchen, we just brought in, you know, an old stove and trash and just a heap of junk. He was a bit of a slob. 
the house couldn't look too big and yet what we wanted to do down below was create a world that was really quite large. We contrived this notion that um, he would just carve out into the earth the rooms that he needed. As you walk down the stairs, you gradually leave reality behind and you get further and further into the mind of Jamie Gum. It was interesting because it was in two separate places. The upstairs was a house in the country. The downstairs was on a stage. I remember Christie designing this labyrinth of rooms. The rooms were designed um, in a sort of a circle or maybe an oval shape so that you could walk from room to room. There was obviously a need for the area where the moths were bred. And then as you kept going around and got further into his world, ending up in his workspace, by the time you got there, you were completely immersed in fantasy. The initial design of the pit was based on the idea that he took over an old well. One of the fortunate aspects of it was that there was a, a hole that looked down onto the first floor of this building, and so we kind of dropped our well into it so that we didn't have to raise the whole set. Mr. My family will pay cash. Whatever ransom you're asking for, they'll pay it. <laughs> Needing to be able to shoot her down at the bottom, which was a bit scary given that we were 100 feet off the floor. <laughs> there was a trap door in the floor and they had to put dirt all around it so that you wouldn't see the trap door because I came up on a ladder and if I had to pee, I had to, it was a big deal. There were images uh, that repeated themselves throughout the movie. Moths and butterflies. It's a hobby, and it's also flight and fancy and change. They were looking for somebody who felt comfortable working with moths. I guess they'd seen the work I'd done in a movie called Creep Show some years, a couple of years before. The author selected the Deathhead Moth as the weak chink in the armor of the madman. We tried to get some out of Asia. They weren't available. It was the wrong time of year, so it became impossible to get them in numbers, which is what we needed. So we had to figure out a way of dressing one of our native moths to look like a death head moth. I used fake nails and we painted the image of this death head moth character on the back. Meet Mr. Acherontius Styx. So this was actually a little flat put on with silk and that's a fake nail inside. It's one of our costumes that we actually put inside of the unit. She's got something in her throat. Ah, the throat shot, yes. I found that mixing Tootsie Rolls with uh, gummy bears really gave me a solid piece that lasted quite a while, and yet in her throat, if she swallowed or if it dissolved, it was a piece of candy, and I felt comfortable doing that. In order to do that, I had to create an image, which was this moth here, the pupa, where I could actually get goo into it, so when he cut in, something would foam out. And this was saffron and oregano and KY jelly all in a tube. And then I would slowly squeeze it up. And then also setting up flying rigs so that I could fly the moth from one scene to the other or fly the moth through a scene. And so then I had to work out a system for doing it. Put a little flying harness on. So you'd have your pole here and the moth would become out here. Now I could do anything I wanted because I could move it with the stick and move it all the way around and get it to fly in, fly out, go left, go right. For the first cellar shot where you go and you find his sort of collection of moths and you see the bug room and then you hear her calling. I was running behind the camera throwing moths over the top, <laughs> almost like, like letting petals out. We were filming in a very cold place in Pittsburgh. And so because of that, I needed a warm room. These animals have to be kept in the 70s and 80s. We designed the room, which was on wheels, which had our lab in it, and that had heaters in it. We'd work with the animals in there up until we needed them for set, and then we would take them out. What we did there was we had the pupa in a hatching box, and we waited until they started to crack. I would then take them and put them in a refrigerator and chill them down. This didn't hurt them, but because they're cold-blooded, it stopped the activity. We'd warm them up and they'd start to wiggle and I'd give him the moth and he could just take the top off. Some of the crew wanted me to represent them because whenever I told the director that, well, the moth needs to take a rest now, he'd say, okay, cut. The staff saying, we're taking a break for a bug, but they needed to do it. There were no moths harmed in the filming of Silence of the Wings. What did you see, Clarice? 
What did you see? Lambs. They were screaming. A large part of the story lived in darkness. I think it required for most of us to sort of surrender ourselves to it so that we could tell the story. The paradox of filming this was that it's such a dark film and it was such a delightful experience for everybody. I don't think when you make a film about horrible things that you create a horrible atmosphere. And the process of making this film was not horrible at all. You don't always get to have such fun on something so awful. <laughs> he kept the set very light-hearted. You go to work with that feeling that you're going to have a good time. Don't take anything too seriously. <laughs> Everybody was having fun. It was almost like a party that was going to maybe go out of control, but people would keep themselves in check because they wanted to do their best for Jonathan. The success of the film is such a product of collaboration. Every member of the crew, whoever they were, felt that they were equal and all the best people for the job. He would open the door to everybody, and his attitude with his picture was, uh, what do you got to bring to the party? He was really open-minded. It's what you hope for on almost all films, to be able to express yourself, have a great collaboration, and make something better than you ever dreamed of. It's a movie, and it's not brain surgery. None of it is. He's very good about trusting actors. Two takes, that's about it, or three if you want them. He knows what he gets, and that's the mark, I think, of a good director. He'd give basic direction on the shot, We'd roll, he'd call, action, and then he'd step into the shot and whisper an adjustment in your ear and step out and say action again. And you'd do the scene with this new adjustment with absolutely no time to think about it. Great technique to use. Jonathan Demi, when he directs a movie, has a stable company of actors that he likes to use over and over and over. Yes. Tracy Walter. Lots of times there's like leaves and things in the mouth. Charles Napier. You do know the rules, ma'am. Chris Isaac. Okay, guys. Ron Vauder, who, who has since died. I'm not certain exactly why Jonathan cast me as the head of the FBI. Well, she's mad as hell, Jack. Maybe because I'd been something of an authority figure when he was first working with me. And maybe he just wanted me to be in a picture so that I had told him what to do so many times he could tell me what to do. Dr. Lecter, I said, do you want me to do it with an accent? Uh, or do you want me to do it straight? He said, do it both ways. I think I did it twice, and that was it. I was finished. Take this thing back to Baltimore. And in this particular movie, he used people who were just on the crew. I was one of the SWAT team guys who attacks the wrong house. The coroner there is Kenny Utt. I saw Kenny Utt, who was one of the producers, and I said, how's it going? And he said, Ted, I haven't felt anything like this on a movie set since Midnight Cowboy. We're making a great movie here. There were not a bunch of executives hanging around the set. And I think a lot of that had to do just with Orion's very traditional support of filmmakers and directors like Jonathan. It was a company that believed in filmmakers, that gave filmmakers an opportunity to make the kind of films that they wanted to make. I think we did something different in Lambs. In terms of the narrative line, we kept making leaps forward in time, and we let the audience fill it in. Lecter's in a, in a pen locked up with a mask on his face and tied up, and he sees the pen put on his bed. And then the next thing we see, there's a big leap. We see him use that to pick a lock. We don't see how he got it. We knew full well that at some point we had to show the monster. I don't feel those moments of violence. I mean, it's a, a trick. All of it is a trick. It's acting. <laughs> Eating someone's face off is kind of ridiculous. This was a very dangerous point in the story. I obviously had to leave Clarice for 10 or 15 minutes during Lecter's escape. It was so brilliantly written in the book. We knew that it would be just incredible on screen. We had to do it. Jonathan says it was like a movie within a movie. We're losing him. It had to be so tightly scripted and so tightly choreographed for the camera and for the actors. And it had to set us up for the third act of the movie. We got him on lactated ringers running and, uh, and the uh, patient is on 10 liters of oxygen. The second kind of action peak has Clarice at the center of it. It's an astonishing thing on Tom Harris's part. 
the two huge surprise reversals, first with Lecter's escape and then with the SWAT team hitting the wrong house. In the book, it's kind of two discrete events. The SWAT team arrives at the wrong house, they realize it's the wrong house, and boom, she's arriving at Gum's house. When Jonathan and I worked over the script, he said, you know what, I think we can go much further with this simultaneous action. Good afternoon. Um, sorry to bother you. When I made the first cut of the scene, I'm almost embarrassed to say that, is that I did it without parallel action. We're going in. No one here, Jack. Clarice. Good afternoon. Um, sorry to bother you. I'm, I'm looking for Mrs. Lippman's family. Somewhere I had heard that they wanted to do it straight. And I kept it that way until Jonathan looked at the first cut. The lights went up and he said, that should be parallel cut. Good afternoon. Um, sorry to bother you. I'm, I'm looking for Mrs. Lippman's family. The trick to it was to reveal a shot of Clarice opening that door at the exact right point. Clarice. Your name is? The moment of recognition when she makes him. Very good, Mr. Moore. May I use your phone, please? Tom Harris's description is something like, and she looked at him and he looked back at her and they knew each other. Sure, and it's phone. just this chilling, chilling moment. Freeze! Put your hands over your head! He enjoyed the feeling of being caught, in a way. It was a tension. It was like it was somebody finally playing at the level that he'd been playing at. A woman who had his number. He met his match. Freeze! Jonathan has always been a great Hitchcock fan. Some of the concepts in Lambs are based on Hitchcockian theories of suspense. You know, the old one that everybody quotes is, you show the audience the bomb on the, under the seat, but you don't tell the characters about it. And so they're on the edge of their seat all of the time. There's a tremendous amount of suspense. You know he's down there somewhere. Don't know where he is. The other scary thing is that the audience has forgotten about the night goggles, so that there's a great advantage in the middle of the scene to being able to say, boom, now the lights are out. And then she's down there, the lights are out, she's moving around, and then you get this image of he's following her and he's in complete control. We did change our own rule about Clarice's point of view and went just for a moment to Gum's point of view. <sighs> the hand coming into frame was something that was sort of an organic thing that kind of happened as we were there and we played with that idea. And so it becomes the same thing as Hitchcock. She's not aware of it, you know, and so we're aware of it. When we were filming and the island of Bimini, the last scene of the film, which actually was the last day of filming, and that last scene when I walk up the street is the very last moment of filming of the entire movie. To walk up the street, I thought I wanted to be like a cat, just moving up the garden path for his prey. After seeing that, very, you know, that very first cut of it, oh, I thought it was wonderful. And then I usually go away from that, uh, kind of in a dreamy kind of cloud. I usually write a lot of music after that. It's just impressions. Like I'll think of certain feelings that I had in watching it, and then I'll try to express those. Because you want to have felt something and then capture those feelings. So it's a very delicate time. You don't want any distraction. Found Land is an incredibly emotional score. And it's not what you would really consider a horror movie score, a thriller. It isn't even really even a thriller score. It's quite operatic. It's orchestrated in a way to really bring out more of the emotional feeling of the music than it is to bring out, like, you know, scary elements. There's not really areas of the score that really try to do that. Another director may have said, well, this is all about this Lecter guy, and he's really scary, and just make him scarier. Lecter did not need reinforcing musically. I mean, he was as scary as you could be in his performance. In the meetings with Jonathan, in the uh, spotting of the film, he said that we could possibly look at the film through Starling's eyes. That led me to writing a very passionate, emotional score based on the Starling character. 
you can find perspectives of how to use music in film through the characters in the films. Jonathan said when he watched Silence of the Lambs, he didn't hear the music as much as he felt it. And he thought that was great. We really worked out the sound and music quite carefully as to where we would use it and how we would use it and how the two of them would work together. Skip provided a number of ambiences that were really kind of spooky and strange. They're all sound effects too there with a little bit of abstract sort of musical sounds. It's like a steam radiator hissing, jail door sounds, all sorts of um, gurgling machinery sort of sounds. I used a lot of ambience and industrial and environmental sounds as well as the orchestral score that I wrote. And I use it, I use it as a teaching tool to show students what you can do, you know, how you can create a space that didn't exist. She's got something in her throat. When the technician reaches in and pulls that moth cocoon out of her throat, Jonathan at the mix wanted to add a sound that wasn't there, which was the sound of a breath. The last breath of her body was plugged by this bug. And someone went into the voice booth and recorded that. Here we had this very dark movie opening in the middle of winter during the Gulf War. And it opened with like $17 million or something, which was a huge opening at that time. And I remember seeing like lines around the block. The movie was a phenomenon. It remained the number one movie for like five weeks in a row or something and, and stayed in the top ten just forever. Silence. The word is out. The word of mouth in the film was so great. People went and went again. The reviews were superb. Arnold the Terminator would make the cover of Time and Newsweek and all those. And suddenly he was being replaced by this other kind of Ubermensch, right? It was Hannibal Lecter who was on the cover of all these magazines. It was, you know, the moment of the serial killer. Not too long after, Jeffrey Dahmer turned up, which was kind of creepy. They ran a picture of mine next to Dahmer's in a magazine, and that was just too weird. Not Hollywood homophobia! There was all this controversy around the film that the Jamie Gum character was coded as gay. And some people really took it to heart and were offended by it. I've talked to people whose feelings were hurt about the characterization I did, and I, and I, I apologize for that. And there were protests at the Academy Awards and all around. Because at that time, I guess what they were saying is there are no gay characters in films, and when there are, it's a serial killer. The gay community, uh, what they thought about James Gunn is uh, probably very different from what we think. Cross-dressing is sort of like seen as something um, taboo and that people do at home and are supposed to be hidden in some dark basement, as he did. Seven demonstrators were arrested. It's odd because I'm very sensitive to those issues, as is Jonathan and everybody else connected with the film. And to be very honest, we were never aware of it when we were filming. And when it came out afterwards, it was a sort of shock. At the New York Film Critics Awards, this guy came through with leaflets about treatment of homosexuals. And we looked at this thing, and Kenny said, oh, this is gonna really upset Jonathan. Then Jonathan was introduced, and he said, I don't know if any of you were aware of these leaflets that were passed out. He said, I think that was extremely gracefully done. And I think we should all read these and pay very close attention to the message because Hollywood has been guilty. And you notice his next film was Philadelphia. The Silence of the Lambs, rated R, starts Thursday, February 14th at theaters everywhere. No movie had ever opened in February and gone on to win any Oscars. You know, it was going to be a full year before its, its Oscar chances. We were totally taken aback that we got the number of Academy Award nominations that we did. We had seven nominations. We were the only movie nominated in all five of the so-called major categories. And I was the first one from the movie to win. And I stayed and watched, you know, Tony win and watched it from the wings when he came up and, gave, and got the standing ovation. And the screaming and the yelling and everything that was going on and everybody hugging and kissing when Tony won, it was, it was quite remarkable. 
I really didn't want to be there. I didn't want to go at all. I just hoped that the traffic would be so piled up that I couldn't get there in time and I could sit in the restaurant and watch the whole ceremony. I didn't want. I just didn't want to be there. I don't like those things at all. I, I really don't enjoy being at those awards things. And when Billy Crystal came on at the beginning wearing that mask, I thought they were just being nice and think, oh well. I, I didn't know what to expect. So when Kathy Bates called my name out and uh, I didn't know what to say. And I mean that, I, 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 did, I really didn't expect that. Ted won, Anthony won, Jody won, and Jonathan won. I thought, oh my lord, this is it. It was an incredible group feeling. You know, it would not have meant anything like the same thing if it had just been an individual triumph. You know, everyone took the bows, but they knew it was Jonathan. It's completely changed my career. From that point on, I played unsympathetic characters. I am not just some turnkey, Miss Starling. Pedophile, call Levine. Call, you know, we got a serial killer. You know, I mean, it was a lot of, a lot of that. I would really had to sort of fight to be seen as, as husband, father, and good person kind of thing. But still, people respect me for it. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Silence the Lambs came as an unexpected bonus to me many years ago, and uh, I didn't expect it. I'd wished for it, but when it came along, I thought, oh, well, this is fun. She never know. I watched the Maltese Falcon, or To Have Now Have Not, or Godfather, Silence the Lambs may fall into that category. There are lots of films that are good, like that. But finally, it's all movies, it's all an illusion in me. I'm just pleased to be part of it. I'll be seeing you.